British Society of Periodontology and Implant Dentistry is delighted to welcome you to the UK Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Treatment of Periodontitis. We have identified and applied the best evidence we have combined with clinical expertise from a broad range of oral healthcare professionals and UK stakeholders to bring you the UK version of the European Federation of Perio Treatment Guidelines. These guidelines have been adapted from these recommendations to make them fit for purpose for the UK health system. We have used the highest level of evidence and it's consensus based. The aim of the guidelines is to improve the quality of periodontal treatment. Also to reduce tooth loss and ultimately improve the systemic health of our population and their quality of life. We would now like to invite you to walk through the flowchart with us. We'll show you what's new, what's unchanged, and we'll show you how to make a difference. There are three broad categories of plaque-related periodontal condition. We essentially have periodontal health, gingivitis, and periodontitis. Health is defined by a small number of bleeding sites only, less than 10% of sites bleeding are allowed to define clinical health. And there must also be a complete absence of interdental attachment or bone loss. The bleeding or the absence of bleeding on probing is a critically important sign for defining periodontal health. Now health can exist on an intact periodontium or it can exist on a periodontium where there has been some bone loss, but that has not been caused by periodontitis itself. Gingivitis, similarly, uh, is either defined on an intact or on a reduced periodontium. Again, where that reduction in the periodontium has not been caused by periodontitis. And with gingivitis, there are between 10 and 30% of sites that bleed on probing to define localized gingivitis and greater than 30% of sites that bleed on probing would define generalized gingivitis. And it's really important to recognize that gingivitis is reversible. And so once treated, a patient can go from being a gingivitis patient to a healthy patient. Periodontitis is defined by the presence of interdental attachment loss at two or more non-adjacent teeth. That attachment loss can either be viewed on a radiograph as interdental bone loss, it can be seen clinically as interdental recession, or you can measure it using a probe. And in the latter case, it would be a probing pocket depth greater than three millimeters. Once a patient has periodontitis, because the bone loss can't really be regenerated, they're regarded as a periodontitis patient for life. So whilst they can never be periodontally healthy, they can actually be stable uh, for the rest of their lives. And that's the objective of periodontal treatment. So periodontitis is then generally looked at or defined according to its extent. And the extent is defined by the number of teeth involved. So localized periodontitis would be less than 30% of teeth. And greater than 30% of teeth would define generalized periodontitis. And then we also have molar incisor patterns of bone loss, which is a third category of periodontitis. Once we've essentially looked at the extent of the periodontitis, we then need to stage the disease and to grade the disease. Staging talks about severity. So stage one is mild disease. Stage two is moderate disease. Stage three is severe disease. And stage four is very severe disease. Grading tells us about the rate of bone loss, how quickly or slowly it's happened. Uh, and that's important because the historical rate of disease is our biggest risk indicator for future disease progression. Step one is where you build the foundations for optimal treatment. It's about getting things right from the start. It centers around professional mechanical plaque removal, PMPR, which includes personalized oral hygiene advice, patient education, removal of stain, plaque, and locally retentive factors, including cleaning in the gingival crevice. It's more than just a scale and polish. You will notice that several members of the dental team can undertake some or all of step one, and we suggest that you select an appropriate member of the team who can set aside the time to provide personalized periodontal care, tailoring advice to the individual and their risk factors 
in order to support behaviour change. So many of us undertake step one so well already. And although the evidence base has been updated, what you're fundamentally doing hasn't changed. Make sure you use language that your patient will understand. Perhaps you could draw them a diagram or show them their bone loss on their own radiographs. Next, we recommend reinforcing that meticulous oral hygiene is the key to success. Have the patient practice brushing and interdental cleaning in the dental surgery. This has the advantage of tactile feedback and you can correct their technique where appropriate. At this point, you could advise on an effective toothpaste and if appropriate, a mouth rinse. Be sure to highlight to your patient risk factors specific to them as an individual. And as outlined earlier, these can be local or systemic. For systemic risk factors, we would encourage you to signpost patients to stop smoking services. And for other conditions, such as diabetes, to book an NHS health check with their GP. Step two of periodontal therapy involves subgingival PMPR as opposed to supragingival PMPR. Not all patients will progress to subgingival PMPR, only patients that we define as engaging patients. And there's no exact science to what an engaging patient is, but in general terms we would say if someone's managed to reduce their plaque and bleeding scores by approximately 50%, that indicates engagement. For engaging patients, the subgingival PMPR is essentially root surface instrumentation or root surface debridement. There's a difference between subgingival scaling and debridement. With subgingival scaling, you identify the calculus and remove it. With debridement, you take a systematic approach to washing away and cleaning the endotoxin associated cementum. The guidelines make it clear that the subgingival debridement can be undertaken with hand instruments or with powered instruments such as sonic or ultrasonic instruments. There's no difference in outcome. The guidelines also indicate that the debridement can be performed in several steps, uh, quadrant by quadrant, uh, at different time points, maybe a week apart, or it can be all performed within 24 hours, the so-called one-stage approach. There's no difference in outcome between the two. However, again, we tend to recommend the stepped approach for two main reasons. First reason is it provides additional points of contact between the operator and the patient to reinforce that behaviour change and plaque control message. And secondly, when the one-stage approach is taken, uh, we create really quite a significant bacteremia. And that is something that is perhaps not advisable to do in someone with, for example, a history of cardiovascular disease. When it comes to the use of sustained local delivery antimicrobials, whether they be antiseptics or antibiotics, for example, uh, then they can be considered as part of step two. Normally, they would be considered as part of step three because we would go through step two and then identify non-responding sites and consider those agents perhaps in rare situations for localised sites. And then finally, uh, we don't recommend the use of systemic antibiotics for managing periodontitis. And the reason for that is really one of antimicrobial stewardship. There is an exception to that, and the exception is that if you have a patient who has a rapidly progressive form, if you like, of periodontitis, a grade C uh, rate of progression, as we would now call it, but that would tend to be performed by a level two or a level three uh, specialist practitioner rather than a level one practitioner. Step three is critically important because this is the review where we undertake the detailed periodontal chart so we can get site-specific data on how the treatment has worked in each individual patient. We would generally define a responding site by a threshold of four millimetres. So if the probing pocket depths are four millimetres or less and there are no four millimetre bleeding sites, we would say that that was a stable result uh, and the patient can then progress to step four of treatment. If, however, you have residual four millimetre bleeding sites uh, or you have sites that are greater than four millimetres, then we would suggest that those sites are re-instrumented normally through non-surgical uh, subgingival PMPR again. For deep probing pocket depths greater than six millimetres, we might consider periodontal surgery, and that could be resective surgery or, or it could be regenerative surgery. 
but that would require referral really to a level two or a level three specialist who's trained to make those decisions and undertake that type of advanced treatment. Celebrate your success. You and your patient have worked really hard to get to this point of periodontal stability. Let's not let that go to waste. Some simple measures can help to keep things this way. Select a suitable recall interval. Monitoring and supportive periodontal care should take place at individually tailored recall intervals in patients susceptible to periodontitis from three to a maximum of 12 months. Engage your patient. It is important that you make your patient aware that lifelong engagement with supportive periodontal care is essential to maintain their teeth. Continue to reinforce oral hygiene, risk factor reduction and behaviour change. We recommend engaging your patient in a verbal contract to take ownership of their oral health by performing effective twice daily tooth brushing. And I know you'll be reminding them about their incidental brushes. Remember that each patient has different abilities, needs, preferences and manual dexterity. Show them how to use their cleaning aids effectively watch them practice and give feedback. A little bit of praise goes a long way. Provide regular supportive periodontal care. Make a plan to monitor the periodontitis. Remember to perform appropriate charting following published guidelines as part of your good record keeping. The British Society of Periodontology and Implant Dentistry would like to realise our vision of periodontal health for a better life. And with your support, we can achieve it. With your teams focused on personalised dental medicine and asking you to champion risk-driven prevention, as well as engaging your patients in ongoing lifelong care. I would like to thank GSK for helping us to bring our flowchart to life. I would like to thank the BSP team for always rising to the challenge. And most importantly, I would like to thank you for your support. We would love to hear your experiences of using our guidelines so that we can share them with our friends and colleagues. Together, we can make a difference. Let's grasp this opportunity now and improve the UK's oral health.